All right, hopefully everybody can see. Um, so my goal here today is for people to be able to take this presentation, understand kind of what is data mesh at the conceptual level, um, and really just be able to then take that and look at all the other content that's been out there um, and apply it with this knowledge. I'm not trying to, to take you from zero to data mesh in, in you know, a uh, 45 minute presentation or whatever. I'm trying to make sure that this is, this gives you the, the foundational information to be able to, to go forward with this. Um, I'm gonna split some stuff in, uh, in, in ways that I think are useful to people so that you can really go forward and then really start to absorb a lot of the, the content because once you, you grok certain aspects of it, I think everything starts to fall into place. And, and I'm not gonna skip over where I think there are still a lot of big challenges as to where we need to go with data mesh as a practice in a community. And by the way, if you hear a little bit of snoring in the background, I apologize, that's my dog. Uh, <laughs> so my caveat here before we start is data mesh is a people process first paradigm, right? There's a lot of tendencies to try and jump into what is the architectural approach and really focus on that instead of you know, how do we change as an organization? How do we change as a broad, um, you know, approach to data, the data culture that includes the architecture and, and all of that. So, um, you know, I think that's a very, very important aspect that we, we want to do. And you will see this slide again, because we're going to start actually with the architecture part. So um, two important terms, kind of concepts that come up. So. The first is uh, Jamak. <laughs> Jamak uh, Bekani is the one who uh, is the founder and creator of the concept. Um, if you're interested in learning more, I she put, has put out a ton of, of great stuff. She put out two articles on, on Martin Fowler's site, but she's also done just lots of presentations across um, with ThoughtWorks and, and elsewhere. So, um, and then the concept of a domain from domain-driven design. Um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, the oversimplified version to get you through this presentation is um, to think of domains as a line of business or a department like marketing or, you know, um, sales and things like that. Uh, it's a much more kind of granular defined concept, but that will get you through this presentation with an understanding of, of what I say when I'm, I'm talking about domains. So we're gonna start by breaking this into manageable chunks. So what is a data mesh? Like what is the actual thing that if you were to look at it, what is the, uh, a data mesh? And then what are the four pillars of data mesh and applying them to creating a data mesh? And so this is what actual like data mesh as a practice, as a paradigm is. It's applying these four pillars to creating a data mesh. So uh, hopefully this will make it a lot easier when we start with like, what are we actually trying to accomplish at the, the architectural level? So breaking it down like this, the data mesh pillars are applicable to many data, data management uh, problems. And you can, it can really feel abstract until you, understand what are we actually trying to, to do. And then there's a lot of people out there, a lot of the content out there, and why some, you know, there's a lot of confusion is there is the pillars are that broadly applicable. And so it's when you can't see the concrete goal, it's it, it gets very, very kind of frustrating for a lot of people. And, and there's a lot of people, again, that are trying to change the definition to just say, you know, using the pillars for any um, challenge is, is called data mesh, and that makes it not like an actual tangible thing that people can understand. So again, the brief caveat, data mesh is a people process first paradigm, right? We want to make sure that we think about that through this whole presentation. So what is a data mesh? The oversimplified definition, this is from kind of a data user 
point of, uh, of, of view is that it's a set of these read only data sets that are formed into domain data products. And I'll call them DDPs throughout the rest of this, just so that we can differentiate between what is a data product in data mesh and what is a data product um, in kind of the broad industry sense. And the broad industry sense is generally a, a uh, product that is heavily backed by data and analytics. So these DDPs are created and maintained by the domains, right? The people who know the, the data best. And a really key aspect of these DDPs is that they're, they're general purpose and specific purpose. They're specific purpose relative to therefore analytical usage, right? This is not for serving operational workloads. This data can obviously flow into operational systems. We're not trying to separate those things, but that it's not for super near real-time access or anything like that, but they're general purpose in that they're not designed to answer a specific question, right? This is something where the domains are sharing what they know, their business context with the broader organization. And I say organization because it can be company, it can be the data mesh could be used across different um, boundaries of, of companies, or it can be used by government and things like that. So I, I try and use organization over, over company. So each DDP is a node on the mesh, right? And so the point of data mesh is that you can go and get at this data, that you can find it, you can use it, you know, uh, all that. Each, each DDP needs to be valuable in and of itself. So a lot of people think about this as a single table being a, 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 a data, domain data product. And I think that's far too small. I think you'll end up with just these things littered everywhere and it becomes very, very difficult to understand it versus you want to group it into a large enough context sharing mechanism to uh, be valuable in and of itself. We also need to make it interoperable, right? Otherwise, you've we've solved some of the, otherwise, if you just have these super valuable um, sets of data, but they're not interoperable with other domain data products, you basically have highly accessible data silos, right? Because you can't combine the stuff across. And so that, that value for the organization comes at being able to combine it. Um, and they've got to be easy to use for the consumers, right? Like, what is the actual user experience? Like, what? how do you make this so that we, um, you'll, you'll see this later that I talk about this, that we lower the bar to being able to um, access and understand and use the data, right? Really make it that we can make this a better experience. And, and we'll also talk about the people process side of, of upskilling your people. So you lower the bar and then you raise their skills and you know, yay to both. So, um, and you know, some, DDPs can have like specific target audiences, just like products do, right? Not every product needs to be for every person, but many of them are going to be for a broader audience so that you're not restricting and saying, hey, I'm just creating all these things for stuff that data scientists might want to use. Um, I want to have a broader audience. Or you may ha actually have um, a data product that has specific kind of consumption capabilities, which are called output ports in, in data mesh that are targeted for different audiences, but you've got the same data, right? So, you know, uh, the data analyst may want to be able to access it via, you know, SQL and the, the data scientist might want to, you know, access it in, in some API method so that they can get kind of at the raw data and the um, kind of business user may want to dump it into a CSV or, you know, you might even build some bridge there. It's not directly part of the data product, but you might build some bridge into, um, uh, you know, a Tableau or a Looker or, or whatever, some kind of dashboarding tool. Um, and part of this again is, is, or not again, sorry, part of making DDPs easy to consume is 
you know, the people who are actually creating these data products need to think about how they're going to make that easy to consume and useful to their audience. But also some of it is done at the, the platform level, which we'll, we'll get into a bit later. So, um, you know, this is service mesh was a, you know, Jamak has said a couple of times that service mesh was a big inspiration point and in why she picked the, the word mesh with data. Um, so it looks a lot like this of, you know, interconnected products and, and things like that within this. Um, so how do you actually make easy to consume DDPs? You know, they're easy to find and understand the data, you know, ease of access via like the pre-made governance and good documentation and all these different things. That This is a very, very deep topic that we could go into, but like the user experience really matters, right? If we're lowering that that bar to making data accessible and usable, um, we have to really think, how is somebody going to experience this? Um, again, this caveat of we want to think about this being a people process first paradigm. So don't lose sight of that, even though we're going into kind of what it is, which is, again, to kind of sum it up, it's this set of read only data products that are general purpose relative to answering a specific question versus being making data available to answer multiple questions right the, the point is to create this big 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 pool of data that you can go and really ask questions of the data and get to answers easily quickly um, you know, understandably with trust, all of that. So from the actual producer point of view of, you know, people who are producing these data products, you know, what is a data match? It's, it's, it's a focus on managing what data is shared, not how it's made, right? So they, they get to focus on the actual business logic that's embedded and, and the transformations and things like this. We need to be adding data and analytics engineering talent to that domain so that we're not just throwing responsibility onto them, we're actually enhancing their capability to share their business context via data. Um, and you know, we need to work with them to think about what data to share, why and how, like, you know, what's the format and, and how can we maximize sharing this context? But like, you know, we need to encourage the domains to not just think about what are the data that's requested from us, but what could we do to share our data um, better with the organization? And some of that is they can be incentivized via, you know, oh, I'm going to get way better insights on what's going on with my domain, it may lead to um, new great products or new great features and things like that. Um, but also it's kind of participating in that broader um, mesh where they can get a lot of data about other domains. And so it's kind of a, a, a reverse prisoner's dilemma of if we all participate in a good faith manner, we're all going to be so much better off. So, so you know, kind of Again, that data culture aspect of it. So, you know, but why would we do this? Like, what do we actually get out of this? So what's the actual value of doing things in this way? So people looking to answer specific questions can go and, you know, relatively easily and quickly find the data. I don't wanna pretend that data mesh is some silver bullet or that if you do data mesh, it, it's gonna solve all of your problems. Like, doing data mesh is difficult and it's not that that this automatically solves everything and that you know everybody can easily do absolutely everything but you've got an access pattern you've got an ability where you know that you can get to the data and that it's not going to be that massive frustration of back and forth trying to find who's got the data trying to get them bought in that they've got to get you that data working with a, a central data engineering team all of that back and forth. You know, when we think about 
immediately being able to get that access, there's a concept that's kind of coming up in, in data mesh of governance based on open by default. So you think about, I'm going to share, you know, this data, what data should I specifically put behind access control? Anything that I shouldn't put behind access control. And, you know, there's going to be some ability to go and talk with, you know, deeper experts in governance if you're not sure. But really, I mean, I think we can all understand that, you know, okay, well, I'm not going to just expose my, you know, PII and in the, these data products because that can cause issues. So I'm going to put that behind some kind of masking, but that we make that um, something where most of the data that we know can be shared without any hesitation is open by default. So somebody who wants to go and try and see what's going on can actually just get to that from day one, that there isn't any you know, approval process or anything like that. That people can understand what the data means and how well they can trust it, right? That we have specific trustability metrics that people can go and, and we're solving the, 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 can I actually trust this? Can I rely on this? Um, they can actually work with it, right? Like that's been <laughs> a, a, a big problem with a lot of data, especially for people that aren't super, super data literate is that we, we provide them with capabilities to actually work with that. And something that, that's emerging that I haven't seen a ton about, um, there was uh, a good post on LinkedIn from, I think, Bill Schmarzo, I think is his name, um, who was talking about kind of reusability of, of data and that's what makes it valuable. But I think underneath that is the repeatability. Can I actually re, can I, can I get to this data over and over and know that I can do that? So then I'm not gonna go and create shadow copies and hoard this data and, and do this. And that if I've done a specific analysis, I can share that with somebody else and that I know that I'm not going, that it's not going to break or that, um, you know, I've got somebody who's watching out for the actual kind of creation of the data around this. So some other benefits from a consumer point of view, you know, you can combine the data across the domains, right? So you've got limited to know of this back and forth to get the data in certain formats to combine or, or having to clean it yourself or prep it yourself of, oh, okay, I've got five different domains that are, uh, uh, that I'm pulling data from, you know, not only do I have to uh, try and get it into a format that I can actually use from the start, but then I have to do all this, um, you know, really, really rough work of trying to, to move it. This is especially uh, important for ML engineers and things like that. Um, you're going to get much faster answers to a lot of questions because again, the data is already there. You've already done it. This is stretching, right? Like you're able to um, to be or, or training or, or things like that of from an athletics perspective, you're able to compete in that. You're able to, to just kind of go out there and do it because you've already done the work. You've already set yourself up for success. Um, likely we haven't seen a ton of measures where we can say yay or nay on this, but likely much higher ROI on, on your data teams because their time is going to be spent on analyzing data, not like trying to get to the data to answer the questions. If, you know, if you've got people who are asking kind of complex questions, they can go and actually get at the data bill or get it data itself. And then again, this repeatability and trust is really, really something that hinders many, 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 many organizations. So from a producer point of view, talk about this a little bit, but like, what's the value of doing data mesh? You have a better handle on what data, data you have. You can get better insights into your domain. It can, it can be from other domains. It can be from the uh, uh, data analyst team. It can be from lots of different ways, but you're, you're going to get your data combined with other uh, domains and get some interesting feedback in a lot of cases. Um, again, the participation thing that, that I talked about a little bit earlier, and then you get additional resources, right? This is not additional responsibilities alone. 
right? We're saying, hey, domains, you're going to own the uh, responsibility of creating these domain data products. You know, that's it. No, we're giving you the additional people and we're giving you a platform that makes it so you can focus on the, the really value add stuff. So, um, sorry, hopefully that didn't pop up on the screen. Um, uh, sorry, weird, funny pop-ups from the, uh, uh, from a different zoom call that I'm not going to be on, obviously. So, <laughs> um, so why does this all matter again? Like, what are we trying to do here? We're, you know, the kind of buzzwordy type thing is increasing, you know, or allowing companies to be data-driven or organizations, I should say, um, increasing agility and scalability of analytics, but really like how? So maximizing the context of data, when we shift that data um, to being owned by the domains, they're the ones who really have that business context and can maximize it in that way. And then, and then we're also maximizing the usability of said data. Um, we're making it so that it's easy to access, understand, combine that, you know, you can actually go and deal with it and know what you're doing. Um, and, and again, that trust thing is, is kind of this underlying uh, issue that I think per, is super, super pervasive and hopefully you know, with good documentation, good measurement of SLOs, SLIs, SLAs, all that stuff, that people can really start to trust that data, which again, can lead to a big reduction in shadow copies and things like that. So it's not only even just uh, agility, it's, it's kind of reducing your, your uh, risk of what data you've got that, you know, IT doesn't really have a handle on that shadow IT aspect. So what does this get us? you know, more people can get to data and that data has more valuable information, right? They can combine it to drive reliable insights that wouldn't have been possible if we weren't specifically making it so that you can get data from multiple domains, right? So you can really start to approach what, um, what is going on in the broader context that we as an organization need to know about that it's not just um, each domain is, is kind of aware of what's going on with their domain. If you're plugging into the broader context, it may mean um, kind of very different approach to things and you, you know a lot more potentially than the competition. So again, lowering the bar to using the data and then we're gonna raise the people skill. So we've got a whole heck of a lot more people that are able to use the data and that we can get to, um, you know, backable by data decisions. I hate kind of the concept of, you know, every day, every decision needs to be driven by data versus it needs to be informed by, right? And that we've got an ability to inform ourselves of what's going on for every decision. And that in, in increased business context in easily consumable formats, right? That we're not just storing it in, in every, um, domains specific language, we're making it so that that's actually also approachable from other people. And again, this, this is not just a magic wand where it's like, boom, we're going to put it out there and this all happens. We still have to figure out how to really get to a lot of this stuff. I don't want to sweep that under the rug. So what, what is really different about data mesh that like, there are the few things that, that it's really, really different than kind of standard approaches is, one is the general purpose data. This is a big, big, big difference that I don't think I've seen when people say, you know, data mesh is a found pattern that a bunch of other companies were doing. I haven't seen anybody really talking about that there is this big general purpose pool of data, that it's just a whole heck of a lot of context out there that people can get access to. Maybe that is what some companies are doing, but I think most of the, the stuff is, you know, I mean, um, I'm not sure exactly how to say his name, but uh, Pythian Strangholt wrote um, uh, an O'Reilly book about managing data. Man it's like data management at scale or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, he's talked about kind of creating these big 
read-only repositories of data for doing something like this. So there are people who have done it, but you know, this is where I think it really, really diverges from general patterns and practices. And we're attempting to maximize context and usability. This has historically been a big, big trade-off, right? Part of pushing the domains to own the, the data is that they're the ones who really know, you know, not just like, is this pipeline broken because, you know, something changed upstream, but something changed upstream and this, this pipeline is now completely not usable, even though it's passing all of its quality metrics, right? So, but we've had this big trade-off between um, context and kind of usability and usability at the broader organizational sense, right? So data marts had very, very high context for the domains themselves, um, and they were very usable by the domains, but they weren't in the broader organizational sense because it didn't lead to anything where you could combine them across domains. Um, you know, they also didn't make them available very easily so other people could get to them. But even if they did, if you can't combine that data across domains, it becomes a, a big issue. Data warehouse, you know, you've got this, um, especially that kind of traditional enterprise data warehouse, where you've got this um, very specific model that people have to fit into. And so if your data doesn't really fit into that and you've got to shoehorn it in there, you're you know, dropping context all over the floor, right? So you know, it, it, it means that you're not really able to understand what's going on nearly as much. Um, the shifting data ownership to the domains, I, as far as I can tell, this is kind of considered a best practice in the industry now, you know, when Jamak originally put out her, um, uh, the first kind of paper about this or even started talking about it, which was happening, you know, six, 12 months before she put out that, that thing on Martin Fowler's blog in, in May of 2019. I don't think that this was as considered a best practice, but we are seeing this, that more and more companies, whether they're doing data mesh or not, are shifting this um, data ownership to the domains. Um, and so I, I wouldn't say that this is like super, super different from everybody out there, but I do think that um, most companies haven't adopted this yet. And then the, the distributed ar architecture, this gets into kind of fuzziness as to what's managed by the platform, what's managed by the team. But uh, the concept around this is that you don't have you know, one giant um, data warehouse or one giant data lake, and that you might, that is owned and operated by one team that becomes a big bottleneck. Um, so, you know, this gets a little bit fuzzy when you start to talk about something like uh, a snowflake or whatever, where you can have it kind of all under one big snowflake account, but that you've got kind of different warehouses in and of themselves at the domain level, and that gets a little bit fuzzy, but it's it's about not having one team where they're the ones who have to deal with scaling technologies to massive, massive um, scale, because a lot of these technologies start to break. So it's, it's kind of that scale out versus scale up concept, and that we distribute that, that ownership into the into the domains as to not that they own the infrastructure that's owned at the platform level, but that they own kind of how it's used and, and, and what's going on underneath that. And that the platform, again, gives them the capabilities to do that easily, where they don't have to spend all their time learning a new thing. So again, the caveat to go back to, there's a people process first. I think this was the last time I put this slide in here, but I want to make sure that people remember this, that it's not, okay, let's let's go and, and put out the architecture and not do any of the people side of things. So what are the data mesh pillars? There's um, domain data ownership, there's data as a product, there's the self-serve data platform and the computational federated governance. And I'm gonna tell you right now, Governance is something where I'm pretty weak on, so we're not gonna go too deep into this, but we're gonna talk about how we apply these, these things to creating a data mesh. So again, domain data ownership is about giving that ownership to those who know the data best. 
we need to give them the, the, the ability to easily manage the transformations to share their context, right? The whole thing is, is about data mesh is these domains know the data best and they're the ones who can share the context and, and do that. But we also need to make it um, possible for them to do this, that we don't, again, just throw responsibility on. So this definitely includes additional resources. Um, and you know, this can get a little bit squirrely when like a startup or something starts to say, well, I don't have a whole bunch of headcount. Can I do data mesh? And it's, and it's like, well, you can take aspects of this, but uh, you know, I don't know that you're, we're at a point where it's very easy to fully build out a, a platform that can handle all of this stuff. So, you know, and, and that if we're just adding again, that responsibility onto the domains, why are they bought into doing this? Um, you know, for not giving them the additional ability to actually own the data. If we just give them that responsibility, that's that to me that that's you know not, not a very nice move. I, I probably would use a, a little bit more colorful language most times. Um, so you know, we're adding data or, or analytics engineers, um, someone that really understands how to manage data and that transformation, and we're putting them into the domain so that they can understand the context and that those transformations and, and how they store that data has that context in it. And then the self-serve platform lets them focus on the data and not the infrastructure. So I thought this was a really great quote, you know, who actually understands the data, it's the domains. You know. Unless you understand the data that you are building and producing, you know, from the actual consumer standpoint, it just becomes bytes with names. So, um, you know, data as a product, it's possibly the most impactful of the pillars, but it can be a bit squishy because some of this is at, at both the DDP level and the mesh level. And like, you know, I, I think we're still as an industry developing the concept of, you know, is the data itself the product and how do we manage as a product the creation, transformation, you know, combination, all of that of data, that we actually manage it with the same kind of concepts and approach and quality level that we do for, you know, kind of software products and things like that. So, you know, we need to have a data product owner within Data Mesh because each DDP needs to actually have somebody that really is thinking about what am I trying to accomplish with this? and that, that you've got somebody that people can go to with questions and things like that. You know, how, what, what is the, you know, how do we manage the quality and things like that? Some of that is at the, the platform level, but also what quality do we need, right? It might be that this, and how often does this data need to be refreshed and how fresh does this data need to be? Because we might not need this data to be insanely fresh so I can uh, you know I can refresh the the data product and compute it once a day and that allows me to, to really put in a lot of the, the the quality aspects of it versus if somebody really really needs something for ultimate low latency then you want to think about optimizing for that and not putting that as a, a, a data mesh product because your domain data products have to have you know very very high level of documentation and of user experience and things like that versus integrating it into kind of a real-time ML um, type model. So we wanna think about what are the actual needs and desires of, of people who would be looking at and consuming this data and the usability aspect of this. You know, there's the data as a product from a, a DDP specific level and as an overall concept as a product, right? So each domain data product has to have um, all of these product considerations. We also have to think about the data mesh itself that we wanna make sure that there's um, a good user experience and that people you know, can get at the data, find it, just you know, discover data that maybe they didn't even know was there, you know, combine it that they're 
It's not a massive pain to take data from a couple of different data products at once, all of these different things. So we need to think about the product aspect as to you know, how do we manage this and, and even thinking about within a domain data product that there are certain aspects of the domain data products that are, are, could be thought of like features and that you add new features, you deprecate features, you might deprecate the whole data product itself. Right, we're measuring um, how we do, uh, or you know, who's using it, why they're using it. We do some kind of uh, product management things of going and actually talking to users. All of those different aspects. Um, you know, what do they want? Do we have it? Like, can we change what we've got? Or you know, it, it, do do people actually even need this or want this, and, and things like that. Um, so data user experience, like you need a, a good and reliable experience, right? And how does each DDP play into the overall experience, right? If I have to learn a new user experience every single time I go and try and access a new data product, that's just a massive, massive, you know, overload of your brain, you know, Max talked about uh, one of their clients has 1,500 data products. You know, uh, JP Morgan Chase on, on uh, this, you know, our meetup said that they've got 600 domains. And if you think about, you know, a lot of domains might only have one or two data products, but some might have five, six, seven. Like, you can't make it so that it's, uh, you have to spend, you know, hours and hours and have that, that kind of, uh, brain space for every single data product. Um, you know, the, the demand research that, that, that I mentioned a little bit earlier, and, and uh, again, that usability at the, the specific level and the broader level. So self-serve data platform, who you're talking to when you say self-serve data platform, um, kind of is very uh, telling because a lot of people think of this as for the data product producers, right? That data engineering builds a platform for data engineering type folks <laughs> and data engineering type work, you know, and we do definitely need to do that. The, the domains, if we're asking them to own and manage these, these DDPs, that they're, um, they're not uh, having to, to manage all the infrastructure and have to deal with all of that. And then the consumers can easily find and get access to the data, use it, understand it, combine it. You know, we need an experience that lowers the bar to using data. So the federated computational governance, again, like I said earlier, this is, this is my weakest topic and it's probably the broadest, but we need to get, we need standards across the organization so that we can actually make this data interoperable. We need tooling to give data producers some of the governance tasks, right? We talked about the access control earlier. Um, you know, we don't want to say, hey, you have to now own all of the governance. We need to give them the tooling to be able to do that, um, but then also the backstop to if, they're, if they've got questions or things that they can, they can do that. And then um, we need, you know, the tooling to automatically control data in a compliant way, you know, are people able to actually copy this data? How can they do that? You know, the, the computational governance part is also like, how do we manage resources so that we're not just, everybody's got Spark clusters spun up at all times or whatever, right? You know, the cost goes way out of, out of whack. So there's, there's a lot of aspects here. And, and I think we're still pretty early on this, but a lot of, of the governance is, is, how do we make this so that we don't have to do all of the work on an individual basis, right? That each DDP has to spend a bunch of time to make their data interoperable versus we've got um, something that, that they just have to, in some form or fashion, adhere to and to make that interoperable. And not all our data has to be and, and things like that, but that we make it so that, that there's a lot of uh, that kind of glue at the end of the day and that we don't make it magic or that we don't make it 
that it's this huge amount of work on the on the domains themselves. So kind of wrapping up. So what didn't we cover? Because it's not really really easy to say underneath any of the pillars. Um, you know, the people process side, like the upskilling, one of, if not the most important aspects of doing data bash, we lower the bar to make using data easier. But we also raise your team's ability to use data effectively. We don't do that. It's, you know, at best, it's, it's not going to have nearly as much of the impact as, as you would want. But you know, it's kind of one of those things where so many um, data projects and uh, data initiatives fail because of data culture, not as much on the technology side. So we need to, to, to focus on that. Um, the additional headcount and resources, um, you can't hire your way to a data mesh. You know, there's lots of reasons for that. You know, there's just not a lot of people that are knowledgeable about it yet. And there's, um, you know, it just, it's it, a lot of this is about your culture and things like that. But, you know, it's not fair to add the DDP responsibility to domains without uh, adding, you know, that help and that expertise to the domains. Some of that is you take the data engineering team and you split it into, you know, people that are building the platform and people that are embedded into the domains, but in a lot of cases, you're still going to have to add additional headcount to do this and do this right. Right? You know, it's got a uh, uh, return on investment, but it's got an investment. So you know, you have to think about how how do you do that, and and how do you make it so that it's um, that it's not just dumping responsibilities onto people. It's enabling them to do the things that are going to drive value. Um, so I just covered this a little bit, but the, the data engineering team capabilities, you know, they're building the self-service platform and they're working in the domains. Like how do you manage career growth in that? I, I, that's a still a big question. I think an interesting model that I've seen is, is kind of 80-20 split where um, people either have 80% focus in a domain and 20% on the platform or 80% on the platform, 20% just kind of floating between domains and things like that. Um, you know, data culture is probably the key, as I've said, you know, invest in your team, <laughs> please, please, please invest in your team. So another big aspect, this is a whole lot of, of, of text, but really it's, it's a journey, right? This is a big transition. It's not something that, that happens overnight. There's also a lot of things that can't be specifically laid out for everybody, right? If everybody had, if, if, we as a broader community try to prescribe every aspect of data mesh, it's gonna fail because it doesn't fit, you know, it's too rigid, it doesn't fit for the, the intricacies of each organization. So, you know, and that's the kind of the second uh, little paragraph in here is if you're trying to just copy some other uh, organization's approach, it's likely to fail. And, you know, we're very early days. Um, in even developing how to do data mesh. So you, you can say we're early in that journey as well. Um, we are still missing a lot of, of aspects of this as to how to really do this and do this in an easy way. Um, but, you know, especially on the tooling side, but also in the practices, I think that incentivizing domains and stuff like that is, is pretty squishy. Um, I think we've got some hooks into them, but if somebody really doesn't want to do this, um, they've got lots of places to push back. So I think we, we still, as a, uh, uh, as a community, need to figure a lot of that stuff. So if you want to learn more, what next? Um, we just need to be sharing information with each other and what we're trying to do and what is and, and isn't working. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of good content out there um, you know, we've got some stuff on the next slide here um, when we jump into Q&A, but like this um, entire concept, we, we want to, like that was the whole point of me creating the community was that I want to be able to share information with people and that we can figure out how to do this and how to make this work 
And the only way that we can do that to really accelerate this so this isn't, you know, seven, 10 years down the road that we start to have best practices emerge, that we start to have good practices emerge, you know, uh, this year and into the next year. And then we start to have best practices the years after that, because if we're all just doing it in the dark, um, we're not sharing nearly as much about what's working and, and what's not and being honest about that, right? Right now, I don't think we have a great answer to how do you store data with maximized context and then make it interoperable, right? Um, I think if you watched Flexport's presentation on our meetup, um, I think they've got a really, really innovative approach that probably wouldn't work at, at a, a massive scale from a domain perspective, but it works for kind of a scale up or, or things like that. But they really, really cut down on domains abilities to share their context because they said, you know, hey, we need you to, to structure it in this way and that it's got um, these capabilities, but we want to create these kind of um, big pools of, you know, general purpose information and then we're going to take those big pools of general purpose information and then domains you also need to then um, create uh, data products that are very specific to kind of what questions you think people might want to answer and then we're even going to take those and combine those into a somewhat of an enterprise data warehouse concept again that's not that's not data mesh because of not maximizing the context but they don't have enough domains where that would become an impossible task or that you lose all of your context. They still have high context data. So is that something that that scales to, you know, 10 domains to 30 domains to 50 domains? I don't know. Like, is, is that a concept that we even want to really explore? Or is it something that is pretty specific to them that works, but that it doesn't work at a broader level? We don't know, so we just need to be sharing that information with each other. So, so that's that's kind of what I've got here. Um, hopefully, this doesn't pop up necessarily on the screen screen, but um, I don't know. Um, so, uh, Ken, good good to know that my dog's not the only one snoring. Um, so, and then if people want to ask question, um, uh, please do throw it into the Q and A, but I'm going through the chat right now to, to see if there's anything in there. Um, so uh, Sergey had asked, how does data mesh ensure the same user experience and easy access to data for end users? So this is, so the, the access is by doing kind of the federated governance um, where we give access by default and then we put data behind, um, behind different uh, access controls. So that's how you do the default easy access to data for end users. The same user experience, we're not there yet at all. I'm, I'm not seeing anything. I, I, I kind of, I wrote something up about this, about where I could see something like a data virtualization being the thing that, that could actually do that. We need some kind of query fabric that makes it so that I have a repeatable experience and that as a domain data product uh, producer, I can plug myself into that and that it's, it's, it's got that, but we don't have, um, you know, uh, ThoughtWorks even put this into their, their tech radar that just came out about data mesh, is that we don't have something that makes it so that there's a similar experience. We can have a similar access pattern like SQL or, or things like that, but you know that there's an actual experience level. I, I don't think we've seen that. Adavinta did a great presentation uh, on our meetup uh, last month about um, they actually go through and with all their data products, they also have another layer of visualization. So do we need to go to that? Do we need to have a, um, a team of, of data analysts that then also take all of the data and uh, help to visualize it because that that seems like it's a lot of effort to push back into the domains if you're you know not adding a ton of resource help there. Um, is data stored in a single location, e.g., data warehouse? If not, how would users know how and where to access the data? So um, data 
like the concept of a single location gets really squishy in the cloud. If you look at what Zalando is doing, Zalando has S3 buckets for every domain. Domains have bring their own buckets. So is everything stored in a single location? No, they're in different buckets, but they're all in S3. So are they all in S3? Is that a single location, <laughs> right? Um, if not, how would users know uh, how and where to access this data? That is again on the building the self-service data platform, right? That platform needs to make it so that users can um, easily get that access and that they don't have to be, you know, if, if you've got some, you know, I, at a previous job, I, I was managing um, AWS costs and um, I didn't need to, I didn't want to have to learn how to do use completely different APIs to access every single uh, bit of data. You know, we were using a, a technology to monitor that, but like if I had to go and learn each time and look up how do I specifically get access to this data? That's a bad user experience. So we need to do that. Um, and how can you ensure the same quality of data across all DDPs? So it's not necessarily that there is the same quality of data. It's that you have a measure of quality. If you have that measure of quality, then you can, you can um, people can see that in the documentation. So how do you actually manage quality that's again on the platform side as the infrastructure to give the domain teams the ability to observe their quality and to talk about what quality they're able to hit. Because, you know, again, you may not need, um, you know, oh, this data needs to be populated within one minute of this event occurring with a 99.999% quality you don't necessarily want to try and hit that for everything because the computational cost is going to be very high and the cost of observing and monitoring and you know really hitting that quality level versus having quality checks you you look at like the difficulty within kafka of even explaining what exactly one's <laughs> delivery is um i think gwen shapiro talked about she wrote an entire chapter in her kafka book um about exactly once and that here's exactly what it means when you think, well, exactly once just means once, right? It's like, no, there's like this whole freaking chapter on it. So like, we need to be clear about what this stuff means, you know, within the, the documentation. It's not just what is the data, what is, what is the context that I'm sharing, but like also what is the data product itself? What, what am I hitting from a quality level? So how do you ensure that? Again, a lot of that's platform level to measure that. And uh, quite often, same business term or KPI can have different uh, definitions across domain. How do you ensure that data in different DDPs does not contradict, conflict with each other? So again, that, that's about sharing that, that context, right? If we, we need to give people enough flexibility to define what they're trying to define, you know, customer is different in every domain is kind of the, the common thing that everybody says. So we need to specifically enable that. Um, and that when you are trying to interoperate, that, that it doesn't cause that conflict where you interoperate in a, in a bad way. How we do that, there's techniques and there, there's things that are emerging, but I haven't seen something that really says, how do we specifically tackle this problem? I would love to see somebody go out there and really, really dig into how do we tackle this very specific time, you know, very boxed problem of this one thing. But so much of data mesh content to date has been the very, very broad level. Part of what I'm going to be doing relatively soon is, is interviewing a lot of folks around how they're approaching these things. So it's a great question. And I would say I don't really have a, a great answer to that. Um, uh, so Luis said uh, about it's a journey slides guides me more into waiting on the sidelines to to learn from early adopters' mistakes. I think that's fair. I think this we're, we're not at a place where if you're not looking to really, really try and do a bunch of this stuff that, you know, it, that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. I think everybody's okay with that. If, um, you know, can you help me better understand the best use cases and benefits of early adoption of data mesh? So the best use cases, I think a lot of it's just, 
if you're really, really running up against the, um, well, what one, the best use cases is the people that are bought in. So if you can find a domain that wants to do this, that wants to share their data, that thinks that this sounds awesome, great. If you if you want to, you know, get them bought in that this stuff's very hot for their career, um, you know, there's a lot of people very interested in this right now. Um, key benefits are, are about what can we get from sharing our data, right? So if we create a, a, a way that we can um, really, really do that, if we can find a use case within our companies or organizations, that's great. It's different for every organization. Funnily enough, our first two presentations of Intuit and DPG Media on, on the meetup, both of them were about we had these different subscription platforms for every product. So we couldn't share information across you know, our different products and that our data was very siloed. So like we needed to create one thing that made it possible. So, um, and then we've got a couple of questions in, in the, the, but I mean, I would say to what are the best use cases? I think a lot of it is we've acquired a bunch of people and we're trying to integrate the data from a bunch, a bunch of different organizations. It's kind of the, the easiest low hanging fruit, but there's lots of different things within every company that could be. So, and I apologize, I didn't see that the Q&A was actually uh, working. So I apologize to the people who, who did that and, and uh, followed what I was saying. So um, curious how, so Aparna had asked, curious how organizations are managing business glossary to standardize meaning of data. Um, W3C, you know, RDF, uh, standard RDF OWL exists but tooling is rather limited. So I would say that this, this is a great point. Um, I talked to an interesting company that was trying to, to handle this. It's got an open source project called Data Singularity. Um, uh, and it's actually not even a company yet. They're just um, have an open source project and then do some service consulting around it. But it, it, it is very um, nascent on exactly how we do this. If you look at what Intuit said, they've got a team that are managing their business glossary that are focused, that's like part of a more core governance team that are saying, this is our, um, our business glossary. And this is what this means. And people need to adhere to that versus like JP Morgan Chase, when they talked about it, they said, every domain's gonna just do going to have their own glossary and that they just have to heavily document it and have that in the metadata. How does that play into a user experience? Eh, we're still figuring that out, right? Like this is still pretty early days. I don't have a great answer there, but it's something that we definitely need to explore a lot more. Um, I, I would like to see more people just share that. So if you want to even just post that in the Slack, about, hey, what are people doing to manage their business glossary? I think that's a great question to ask in the Slack and just see what, what people are thinking and what's their approach and things like that. So um, Matthias had asked, um, how would you go about estimating and quantifying the benefit that a company might get from transitioning towards a data mesh? It depends, I know, but what steps should a company take to get a handle on this question? So I think one thing that, um, a lot of people have talked about with this is what percent of your question or what percent of your decisions are being data driven? And then we start to talk about, okay, how do we get to be more data driven? And what does data driven mean? You know, how do you think about the return on investment when, when a lot of the investment is in the people and, and things like that? It's, it's a bit of a squishy answer. As you said, it depends. I know I, I agree with you. But like, how are we getting to a, um, a benefit? It, it, it's very much about, are you bought in that if we're able to much more quickly make changes, right? Um, you, you could even think about where did we miss something with the market? How long did it take us to detect that something had changed? Um, that's something that can be uh, a, a good first order as to, okay, what's the benefit? Is what is our ability to actually understand what has changed or what's our timeframe between 
asking a question and getting an answer, right? If it's six month turnaround to, I want to get to this data to ask this question, um, like how does that, how, how can we change that and how can we actually get to that, that, that complete change? So um, I think this is just a troll question. Yeah. So, um, and then there are a couple of people in the chat. So, um, so one of the questions I see uh, is the comments regarding a DDT team being able to define their product, but it relies on some other team providing the tools to define that product. So the question, can you start building a, a domain without the tools? Can you build, so can you start building a, a data product um, without the, the data platform in place? Um, you could, but that's a lot of heavy lifting on the domain, right? The whole point of the, the, the data platform, at least this is what I think the question is about, is um, what is the, what do we do to enable them so that they're not um, having a, a, uh, a really, really hard time managing creating their data products? Um, and that we need to work with them to, to build a minimum viable platform, right? You don't try and build ahead and have your whole platform um, do absolutely everything at the very beginning. Um, you're going to spend your time to, to, to focus on that. Um, so it's, it's a tough question of chicken and egg. You know, how much of your platform do you have to build out before you do that? How how much are you, you know, the domains need to work with the data platform team to build the tooling to, and, or it's, and it's not even the tooling because the, we don't want the domain teams to care about what tooling is being used. We want them to care about the capabilities. So, um, so uh, sorry, uh, it looks like the other question wasn't a troll question. So I'll see if I can remember what it was because um, I had already, dismissed it, but I think it was like, what's the opposite of data-driven um, and, and how do we use that to get towards a data mesh, which I guess I was thinking was um, something a little bit different that you were, you were trying to say, but I'll, I'll take it as, you know, we're not data-driven now, like how do we get towards data-driven? Um, if we're not data-driven right now, like, how do we measure that? How do you measure what percent of your, your decisions are made backed by data? Um, and that's, that's a hard initial task if your organization isn't bought in to actually um, trying to become data-driven. Like if the execs don't wanna be data-driven, if they just wanna be gut-driven, I've, I've had to deal with that at, at, at companies past where we wanted to just be gut-driven instead of, uh, data driven. And um, so, you know, if you can start to hit on what that pain is, like, what is the pain that people are actually feeling? What are you running across that makes it so that this could be helpful? And again, data mesh is, it's, it's the whole, it's a journey thing of, you don't have to jump, you know, full body, you know, two feet first in or whatever, you want to dip your toe into this and see, can we do this? Can we get to a culture where this matters? Can we get to a culture where, where we're able to actually execute on this? And, and do we want to become data-driven? And, and a lot of people are, have asked me, how did you drive buy-in from bottom up? And, and I think the answer is a lot of times you don't, um, because if, if the execs aren't bought into the concept of we want to be more data-driven, then everything that you show them about data mesh isn't gonna <laughs> move the needle. Um, you know, I think the, the big buy-in points that you can talk to about driving buy-in as well for data mesh is, um, look, when you think about, uh, about like the internet and why the internet is so useful, it's not that 
the internet is built to answer specific questions. There are certain things within the internet that are built to, to answer specific questions. But you can go and you can learn about something across, you know, 15 different things. Um, you can, you know, across 15 different websites or, you know, you look at like kind of how Wikipedia is. If you think about that concept, if that's, um, if that's something that, that you think would be valuable, then, you know, I'm not putting it all that great because I'm just kind of trying to do this off the top of my head. But if you think about how we're, we've organized data with the internet, uh, you know, wouldn't it be good to do something similar that we make it so that people can actually get access to it? So um, I think we've got one last little thing in the chat and then I'll let everybody go. Um, so Will F commented, the opposite of data-driven is unguided organic growth. Um, for example, data lakes without governance become data swamps that ultimately lose value. And I, and I fully agree with that. I think that's, that's a good um, kind of send off point on that is, is that, you know, if we're not data driven, we're just kind of careening around and hoping. And, you know, I think yeah. one of the, the telling stories about data lakes was that people, you know, some uh, exec was so, so proud of their data lake because they had 100% coverage of their data. And it was like, okay, but what are you doing with it? What's the actual quality of this? Like, <laughs> why? why? Why are you streaming in all of your data into this thing um, just to stream it in there? And it's like, well, it might be useful versus let's, let's find a way to ensure that it's useful and that we, we think about who might use it, why they might use it, how they might use it, and that we're, we're focused on building the bridges between that. If that's data mesh, awesome. If it's not, at the end of the day, I, people probably won't believe this, but I don't care. Like if we can find a way to solve these problems, that's what I wanna find for people. I, I wanna help people that are having issues with getting value out of their data and, and that we, we invest in our people and do, all, that's the whole reason that I really got excited about data mesh was investing in our people and, and doing things like that. So. Um, that's kind of where I'm coming at this from. If, if it's data mesh, awesome. If we're able to prove out that, that data mesh isn't the right thing, then I, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> like it, it's, that's fine. It's, we we want to get to a big enough um, set of, of data that we can be data-driven on whether data mesh is the thing to be data-driven, <laughs> as ridiculous as that might sound. So um, I want to thank everybody so much for spending time with me. I'm, I'm in the Slack. Uh, feel free to ping me with any questions. Feel free to, to clap back at me about anything I said where you don't agree with it. Great. Like, let's have a discussion. Um, I want to be here to be uh, useful to folks. So any way that I can do that, please do let me know. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day.